Hello and welcome back to the warehouse of the Rock Island Auction Company where in uh, only a couple of weeks this M41A1 is going to be put on the auction block and this is part two of our tour. If you missed part one, well go ahead and click the link at the bottom for the exterior. Part two as ever, we're going around inside. So now I've come into the TC seat. I can't really complain. It's an American TC seat. It has room. Now granted, I do have to keep a foot on either side of the gunner seat, uh, otherwise my knees would be in his back, but I have room to do it. I can even stretch out my legs all the way forwards and it won't interfere with the gunner. Fantastic. To see out, he has five vision scopes and a primary unity sight out front. Uh, speaking of which, all these optics is why the light is playing havoc. We tried, we can't fix it. Primary sight here, the Periscope M20A1. Now this is an auxiliary sight extension. It basically shows you what the gunner is looking at. It also means that the TC can operate the gun himself. He has the override controller on the right. It will traverse the turret. It'll elevate and depress the gun. And there is a big red trigger on the front. I wonder what it does. And of course, being the TC, he also gets to play with the radio. Ordinarily, it's the ANGRC series. Uh, it could be one of a huge variety, and in this particular vehicle, it's none of the above because the bustle is empty. So as you get into the gunner's seat, which is, again, a little tight, but not bad, you are faced with his control equipment. Now, the original M41, as I said, had a different traverse system. It came with a spade grip, uh, mounted a little bit high and right, typical sort of thing. Now, this was replaced. You get into an A1, and you are faced instead with a steering wheel. I don't think I can ever recall seeing it on many other vehicles, so it wasn't obviously a blinding success, but that's what they chose to do. And from neutral, as you go right or left, the further you turn the wheel, the faster it'll traverse. So a full traverse will take about 15 seconds. Not too bad. Now you recall I had mentioned about the commander's power elevation and how I would come back to it. The reason is that the gunner doesn't have power elevation. The commander's control goes into this control box up here. But the gunner is stuck with his manual elevation on the bottom left. Now on the A1, this is a geared system. And as you can see, it's, it's actually very light. It's a well-balanced gun, I can't argue it. On the earlier M41, it was a hydraulic pump system, a bit like you'd find on, say, a Pershing. Heavy, slow, they got rid of it. They went with the geared system instead. Your trigger is on the front of the manual elevation handle. There's obviously would be an electrical cable goes from there. And of course he also has a manual traverse option on the right. Now to see out, he has the same M20 periscope system that the commander had. It is a bisect sight and it has a reticle which is mill graduated in a pretty much a manner similar to you'd recognize from modern tanks today. It's uh, two and a half mil, five mil. I'll put a diagram on. And with it, you can estimate range. You have to also manually induce lead. But you don't apply super elevation yourself. That is done by use of the range drum up here. So it's in hundreds of yards, and it's calibrated for caliber 30, HE, AP, or HVAP. So you set your range scale, and you might be able to see it starting to move forwards and backwards, so it would adjust the sight mounting. Once you have the appropriate scale set, your sight has been adjusted accordingly. You now aim the reticle back onto the target and your range should be a hit. The auxiliary sight, which is not mounted here, is the M79. This is a simple direct telescope. It is a by eight and it has a graduated reticle for AP only. Very simple sight. Now, if you wanted to fire something other than AP using the auxiliary sight, well, the manual has a conversion chart that allows you to convert X many hundred yards for AP equals Y many hundred yards for HE and so on. And some vehicles wouldn't be perhaps unheard of to have it simply taped to the side of the auxiliary site. As I spin around to the right so I can access what's on the right hand side of the turret. Gun control box, 76 millimeter, caliber 30 and elevation control for the TC. Further down to the right, just behind the manual traverse, is the azimuth indicator. And that, of course, would be used for indirect fire primarily. To estimate elevation, 
there are markings on the breech block that you will place a gunner's elevation quadrant on the breech block and then you do all your mathematical calculations. That's why you got a master gunner in your unit. The gun is the 76mm M32. Fires a wonderful array of ammunition. AP, HVAP, Sabo, HE, Heat, Canister, and White Phosphorus Smoke. Can't argue that at all. Now, it's not going to punch through main battle tanks, but uh, pretty much anything else you're going to come up with in the 1950s, it's going to be a threat to. Now, this M41A1 would come with 65 rounds of ammunition for the main gun. This is an increase over the earlier M41, the reason being that the new gun control system doesn't take up as much space under the gun. So what they've done is they've taken advantage of that space and put a combination for an additional eight rounds. In the event that the electrical trigger fails to fire, well, your backup is this manual push button here that you slam forward. And you'll note that it is basically in front of the recoil guard. It's going to be incredibly disconcerting. I mean, obviously looking at it closely, it is safe. But uh, yeah, I think I prefer some of the other systems where there's a big handle or a foot pedal or something. All in all, this is a very capable vehicle, especially when you consider the condition of most vehicles in 1951-52. The, but the only thing it doesn't have is the stabilizer. However, that was, again, it was going to be intended that the Metrovic system will be installed and it just wasn't up to par. But apart from that one regression, this is actually a very worthwhile little system. Anyway, loader side next. So I've come over to the left-hand side of the turret. Now, early prototypes for the vehicle came with the gunner and the commander on the left side and the loader was on the right. Well, as you can see, they have changed back to the more typical version. I'm not actually even sure what the logic was behind that on the Chafee. But now with my right arm, my strong arm, I can shove the round into the breech without any great difficulty. Now, the loader, of course, is responsible for not only loading all that ammunition, which, as you can see, has vertically mounted ready rack on the left. It has the ammunition underneath the gun. And, of course, now that the bow gun has been deleted, you have additional ammunition on the right-hand side of the hull. But in order to access it, you do have to spin the turret a little bit to the right, and that way the loader can reach it. Also, perfectly visible from the loader, because there's no basket, is the driver. So I'm sure the cameraman will be happy for that one. He does have a basket floor of his own. It looks a little bit skeletal, but there is a rotating platform down here, so it's not all that bad. So the coaxial machine gun. Now, you had 5,000 rounds of 30 cal you could fire out. The machine gun was the M1919A4E1. And good luck tracking one of those things down. And what it was, it was a sort of a stopgap pending the arrival of the M37 machine gun. I think about 18,000 of them were built, and I don't know if anybody has ever seen one since. So there's a challenge for you if you happen to have one around. If you were feeling particularly violent, however, you could also mount a caliber 50 coaxial machine gun. Now, the difference there was you only had 2,175 rounds for that. Uh, in addition to the 600 rounds for the Pintle mounted caliber 50 that the TC had. The difference between the two, well, I mean, if you're shooting an infantry, which you probably are with a coax, a 30 cal is plenty good enough. If you're shooting at lightly armored vehicles or soft skins with a caliber 50, use a 76. It, why, why complicate the issue? Now, you did have the option very similar on the M47 as well. Some of them could come with a caliber 50 coaxial. As you can see also, we have stowage for the caliber 30 carbine. I don't know if the Guatemalans were still using caliber 30 carbines at the time, but it's not beyond possibility. And, well, he does have his own little periscope at the front, but it does not rotate. It is fixed in azimuth. Dome light above, and really that's it. Again, this is... People think I'm biased because of I like American tanks. No, I like American tanks because they make sense. They are well designed. The loader is, is well equipped here. He's got no problems at all. Uh, the one thing he is missing on the A1 is a sort of a loader safety override. On the regular M41s, there was a toggle switch on the roof at the back that he could press it and the gun would not fire. He broke the electrical circuit. 
Uh, perhaps they realize that in stressful situations, the loader forgot to turn it off again and gunner goes to click and you have a misfire. So the loader really is very comfortably sorted. And all, again, just like in the Sherman, I can access all this ammunition without getting off of my seat. Now, granted, if you wanted to stand up, you didn't need to be particularly short. This is, well, I'd say maybe about five feet of headroom. But you don't need it. And better yet, if he's standing up, he's at eyeball death laid and safe. Other than that, well, unfortunately, of course, the breach has been somewhat demilled from this vehicle. They've welded it shut and torched it. Behind the breach, you got the recoil guard, and then you have a piece of padding hanging down on a mesh. And, well, that basically uh, is a little bit of impact reduction if shell casings come flying out a little bit too hard before they fall down onto the floor. Directly above the gun, you're going to see next to the dome light, the master power control. And well, this is basically master power for the turret for its motor system. Okay, thus ends our tour of the loader side. And well, now I shall easily slide forward to the driver's compartment. So the driver's position and well I look a little bit cramped and I'm not really it's because the seat is frozen in the up position and what I, I mean who routinely drives their collector vehicle hatched down so I guess it's understandable. Speaking of hatches it's a very simple swing and lower there is a small little sub hatch I guess you'd call it you can insert an M19 infrared driver scope so you can drive around with those infrared headlight beams going and in theory, nobody can see you, at least that was until they invented passive infrared detectors. Probably would be stowed in this little bin here. Now to see out in daylight, he has the three main vision blocks to his front and there's an additional one over his left shoulder, because why not? Controls, well, these are the older tiller controls. And after somewhere in the mid 2000s, I think it is, they changed the controls to be horizontal. There is a builder's plate here. It proudly announces that this is uh, M41 number 1997 off the production line, so you can figure it out from there. Two pedals, because it's an automatic transmission, so there is a really, really big pedal, which is the accelerator, and another really, really, really big pedal, which is the brake. Pump there for the fuel primer. The dashes and gauges are kind of scattered around. On the left-hand side, we have RPM and speedometer goes up to 60. Other controls on the right hand side, well further forward and to the right you have the controls for the auxiliary engine. That's the one that's back and to the right and allows you to run the electronics without using the main engine and sucking down all the fuel. Further back you have controls for your lights, your master power switches on this panel and the controls for the engine itself. So magneto control, left, right or both uh, together with the starter button, boost control, fuel gauge, master power and just above it is the receptacle for slave starting. The transmission is selected by use of the lever at the bottom right here. It's a very, very well laid out, easily understood transmission. If you can't figure out how to operate this automatic transmission, you have no business driving a vehicle. Directly underneath me is the escape hatch. It's round, it's I think it's small, but I guess if you're well motivated, you'll get out. Anyway, that's pretty much it. Driver's compartment, not much else to say. All in all, about 5,500 of the M41 series vehicles were built, and no small number found their way to the service of foreign nations, such as this one. A whole slew of upgrades were available for the M41, given its long service life and a lot of countries that probably couldn't afford to buy new tanks. They very, you could replace the 76 with a 90, you could replace the petrol engine with a diesel. 
You could improve the fire control system. The Brazilian and Danish modifications were particularly impressive. Indeed, it was a Danish modification which spelled the end of the line for this particular vehicle. In about 98, the M41 DK1s went out of service, and about a dozen of them found their way to Guatemala. It made perfect sense. It's a tank in general with which they were familiar already, and it was just improved. So it's a bit of a no-brainer for the Guatemalans, and thus the older, unupgraded tanks were made available to private collectors on the open market. And this means that a couple of weeks from now, some lucky bugger is going to have the money to buy this thing, take it home and adopt it and hope the wife doesn't get angry. I'll let you know in the text box afterwards what this thing actually sold for. But in the meantime, I hope you found the tour of the M41A1 Walker Bulldog interesting and informative. And as ever, I will see you on the next one. I have my five, I think it's five, one, two, three, four, three, yeah. Three, two, one. Okay, so now I'm in the TC. What is that shadow? I was wondering, would it do any good to point that against the wall and just have it and, and a little it. less direct? Like we did something like, yeah, not, like not right into the no, camera? It's not going to work. No. Uh, let me lower the brightness down a bit. Oh, I think the hatch wall is part of it, or this shadow, but. Oh, that's not too much. Yeah. Oh, it's your. It's, it's, it's your light. It's the light coming from up top. Is yeah. What it is. Yeah. No, there's, there's no way. If you can't beat them, join them. Yeah.